I welcome you all to the fifth NLS union debate. The union debate itself started as a concept with a vision to bring together different hold stakeholders in society, prominently the most, like the foremost leaders in terms of different streams of different areas of policy making, the students themselves, faculty members and professors of different universities and prominent stakeholders of civil society. The vision of the union debate was always to bring them all together under one platform, not only to raise awareness about these policy issues that plague the whole country, but at the same time to ensure direct engagement between all these stakeholders in the same platform. And so far, we, have, we are glad to say that we have successfully hosted four editions. And the fifth edition, we, we seek to take forward a long leap in that furtherance. Let me introduce the speakers for today's debate. In proposition, the first speaker we have is Mr. A.G. Nurani. He's a senior advocate in the Supreme Court and a constitutional expert. He's been a regular columnist in the Hindustan Times, Frontline, the Economic and Political Weekly, the Dainik Bhaskar, and has written numerous books on various issues related to, for instance, he's written a book on the Kashmir question, Badruddin Tiabji Minister's misconduct, the Brezhnev's plan for Asian security, the presidential system, and the trial of Bhagat Singh and constitutional questions in India. We welcome him, and we re I request the Vice Chancellor of our university to kindly felicitate him. Thank you, sir. Our next guest speaker for today is Mr. Shashi Kumar Velat. He is currently the director of programs at Amnesty International India. He's a senior editor of Invest he was the senior editor of investigations at CNN and IBN and has also been the editor of News for Tehelka and NewsX. Most prominently, he was a war journalist and reported from the Iraq war in 2003 and to 2004 as a non-embedded independent journalist covering the fall of the Saddam regime traveling from the Kuwait-Iraq border and following the trajectory of war as the coalition forces swept through southern Iraq and finally reached Baghdad a day before the Saddam Hussein regime collapsed. He received the Ramnath Goenka Award for Excellence in Journalism, the Transfer Interna Transparency International Award, the Green Oscar Award, and several other awards in recognition of his services as a journalist. We welcome him to today's debate, and I request uh, Mr. Uh, our Vice Chancellor to kindly felicitate him. Our next speaker is uh, our own Dr. V.S. Sridhar. He is currently the Deputy Director and an Assistant Professor at the Center for Social Inclusion, Exclusion and Inclusive Policy in National Law School itself. Prominently, he was a member of the People's Democratic Forum and has been a member on several fact-finding missions that have been organized based from Bangalore, which have been organized in Karnataka and outside, prominently in the region of the Kashmir Valley. He has reported several atrocities on Dalit, wo Dalit women and religious minorities and has covered a lot of human rights violations in Kashmir. He's edited and translated a book on Kashmir based on the writings of K. Balgopal, an eminent human rights activist. We're glad to have you as our speaker, sir. And I request the Vice Chancellor to felicitate him as well. In opposition, our first speaker is Lieutenant General Satish Nambia. He's of active service in the country's northwestern and northeastern theaters, including counterinsurgency operations in the 1965 and the 1971 conflict. He was the Director General of the Military Operations at Army Headquarters and was a member of an Indian Army training team in Iraq from 1977 to 1979. He was a military advisor at the High Commission of India in London from 1983 to 87 and was deputed by the Government of India as the first force commander and head of mission of the United Nations Force in the former Yugoslavia, initially as the Assistant Secretary General and later under Secretary General and commanded it under, uh, for a year under most difficult conditions. He, he received the V Chakra for gallantry in battle during the Indo Pak conflict in 1994. He, he received the Ati Vishit Seva Medal and the Param Vishit Seva Medal and currently is involved in the study and analysis of UN peacekeeping operations. We're extremely privileged to have you amongst our speakers today, sir, and I request the Vice Chancellor to felicitate you. Our next speaker in opposition is Major General Nilendra Kumar. He was a Judge Advocate General of the Indian Army from 2001 to 2008. He, took, he actively took part in the 1971 war on the Western sector and was seconded to Judge Advocate General in 1982. He is an expert on military law with several books to his name on the subject. A lot of them currently also find a place in our own library. 
He was a part of a seminar organized by the International Committee of Red Cross at Geneva, the meeting of experts on direct participation of civilians in hostilities in 2003 and 2004, the Indian delegation to the UN on steps to eradicate the illicit trade in small arms and light weapons in New York in 2005. He was awarded the Vishesh Seva Medal in 2004 and the Ati Vishesh Seva Medal in 2005 for rendering distinguished service of a high order. And presently, he is the director of Amity Law School under Amity University, Noida. We welcome you, sir, and I request the Vice Chancellor to correct you. Our final guest speaker for today is Major General K. S. Venugopal. He is the General Commanding Officer at the Karnataka and Kerala sub area currently. He commanded his company in Operation Pawan in Sri Lanka in 1988 and counter insurgency operations in the valley from 1996 to 2007. He was awarded the Vishish Seva Medal for exceptional actions in bringing down terrorism in the valley and currently is in charge of administering all the troops located in Karnataka and Kerala. We look forward to hearing with the debate, sir, and I request our Vice Chancellor to you. Thank you. We all understand that today's topic is something that is not only inaccessible to civil society, but is highly esoteric in the content in terms of what we're discussing with regard to the repercussions of military operations in various areas in India. All of us understand that there's one, the one thing that we require today the most is an engagement exactly between the officers from the military itself and members of the civil society. And to understand the intricacies behind the topic and to, under, and, and to get an overview on what this debate ought to be about and the direction it potentially should take, we have Lieutenant General Vasant R. Raghavan as our introductory speaker today. He is currently the president of the Center of Security and Analysis in Chennai. He was a member of the India's National Security Board. He was a, he was a commissioner of the Weapons of Mass Destruction Commission, of the, uh, chaired by Dr. Hans Blix and later advisor and research consultant to the International Commission on Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament convened by the governments of Australia and Japan. He has authored several books, among which are India's Need for Strategic Balance, an essay on limited war and nuclear escalation in South Asia, a book on infantry in India and the Siachen conflict without end. These are some of his most famous books, and he is a prominent expert in military law and strategy. We are extremely privileged to have him introduce the motion today, and we welcome you, sir, and I, I uh, request the Vice Chancellor to felicitate him as well. I also welcome Lieutenant General Ravi Aip and Brigitte Mushtaq as distinguished guests for today's debate. Without further ado, I pass this debate on to the moderators, Badri Narayanan from fifth year and uh, Prem Ayaturai from fourth year. They'll be carrying forward the debate and we hope to have a, a good session of engagement. Now before that, we will have our introductory talk for the next 25 minutes by Lieutenant General V.R. Raghavan. Also have two student members from National Law School joining us for the debate. On side proposition, we have Mr. Dheer Bhatnagar, who is a student of our fourth year. And on the, uh, on the side opposition, we have Rudrojit Ghosh, who is a student of our second year. I wish them good luck, and I now invite Sir V.R. Raghavan to begin the introductory talk. Mr. Vice Chancellor, faculty, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished panelists, uh, many of whom were my colleagues, some are extremely well known, like Mr. Noorani, and the panel has been made even more lively by the inclusion of two law school students. So it's a perfect evening to spend, to be stimulated 
intellectually. The, for me personally, it's a great uh, privilege to come and speak here. As I enter on the roll of honor, I find my daughter's name. She was in the first batch of the National Law School. And uh, let, uh, let me tell you that that young lady's life and personality was changed by her. It made her a better person, a tougher individual who was quick on the feet and could intellectually and rationally analyze the situation. And my family, therefore, have a great deal which we owe to NLSIU from the first director to now. And the institution has gone from strength to strength, pushing the envelope of excellence. And this debate is one example of how intellectual freedom has been given to the student body and my compliments to the vice chancellor and the faculty. I think all of you are truly fortunate to be an institution of this kind with the magnificent resources, but more than that, a faculty which is open to suggestions and ideas. The debate seems to place civil society against the armed forces. And I therefore was very surprised to see the thematic development which uh, Yogesh and others have conceptualized. It almost looks as if civil society doubts the ethics of the armed forces. It's a serious situation. And those in the armed forces must take note of it. And only a student body like the NLSIU could have come up with this startling proposal. Uh, I look forward to this debate because it gives me particularly as the opening speaker an opportunity to present the two sides of the debate from an objective and neutral point of view. India has been, by in been doing counterinsurgency almost from the day to be. Therefore, CI ops, as it is called, counterinsurgency ops, is a reality, is a permanent reality in India. Very few countries have faced such problems, have kept together as a country and nation state have evolved as a nation state and have, have come to the level of economic and other growth, have developed the confidence as Indians as our country has done. And therefore it is time to look at the role of armed forces. Let me start by saying that moral accountability is a central part of what it means to be a human being. Every human activity must be open to moral and ethical questions, on questions of right and wrong. And what must apply to extreme activities like armed conflicts, where normal ethical norms or rules like not killing have to be overridden. The rules of war, or rules of engagement as they are called, have existed, have existed since war became an organized part of human society. Even the Mahabharata and Ramayana tell you about the rules. They were rules. And Christian thinkers from Thomas Aquinas onwards have thought about it deeply because the Western world came out to this level through terrible, gruesome wars. And the just war notion, the idea of just war, has been put together in two great volumes. I'm sure 
law school teaches you that about just as bellum and just as bellow. The first one looks at the morality of going to war and the second looks of, at the morality of how it is actually waged, how war is waged. So is there a distinction between war, conventional war and counterinsurgency operation? Because wars have changed from Napoleonic wars where you took a massed your armies, saw the other army, and decided which flank to attack from. So 50,000 people charged into other 50,000 people. That was war. And by the evening, a kingdom had gone, another monarch was born. That's not how war is fought today. It's fought across continents. And from those set-piece battles through tanks and aircraft and submarines, we have moved away to what is called asymmetric war. Because parts of society which cannot fight the state, fight the state now through bombs and mines and assassinations. There is what is called a revolution in strategic affairs. There is a famous writer in King's College in London, Sir Lawrence Friedman. He says, wars today and in future will be conducted not in some isolated field, but through society. Earlier wars were fought outside society by armies. Today it will be fought through society. And in a book published not long ago called Just War Revisited, people are examining the idea of just war. Oliver O'Donovan says, and I quote, in internal conflicts, non-government armies, non-government armies pursue the strategy of disseminating armed units invisibly through the population. So you may be staying in Nagar Bhav, but there are enemies of the state, armed and ready to fight the state, staying in the same locality. What does it do? O'Donovan says, this places the whole population, including you, in the position of a hostage shield behind which they fire. Why? Because they want a military response by the state, which kills citizens and which gets them a huge propaganda advantage. Perhaps you were too young when Margaret Thatcher Prime Minister of UK said, propaganda is the oxygen of the terrorist. He doesn't kill to kill you. He kills to demonstrate to a billion people that he can, the state can do nothing and he can kill. In Stanford University, where I taught for some time, in October 2010, Richard Rhodes, who wrote a famous book, The Making of the Atom Bomb, he says, what is the dividing line between conventional and insurgency? The dividing line is very clear, according to him. Soldiers fight those who fight them. Soldiers fight those who fight them and not bystanders, not those who are outside the zone. But the insurgents do it the other way. Therefore, we should leave protection and violence to people who are professionally trained to be violent, so that the rest of us do not go stabbing each other. It was said only two years ago. So CI Ops involves actions taken by a recognized government of a state to quell insurgency taken up against it. Actually, the state will fail in its responsibility if it doesn't do so.
Such operations conducted by major powers like France and USA in Vietnam, UK in Malaya, currently by the United States in Afghanistan, are not operations con conducted in their own country as we do. They conduct these operations in somebody else's territory. I hope Amnesty International takes note of that. The rules of engagement they apply include artillery, bombers, missiles, drones, fired from outside that territory. In other words, what is called CI ops or counterinsurgency operation is in fact war in a foreign country. These rules and tools cannot be used by the Indian armed forces against our own people, even though they may be throwing bombs. We don't use artillery, helicopter gunships, missiles against our own citizens, even though it raises our casualties. We have not relocated villages. We have not displaced thousands of people, as did people did in Russia and other parts, to sort this insurgency problem. Because Indian armed forces don't operate against enemies. They operate against our own citizens to create conditions in which the government can negotiate with them and restart governance where there is no governance, thanks to the insurgent. So that the aspirations of these people who have taken up weapons can be met. But the government cannot talk if a gun is held to the head and said, please do as we say. So there are no enemies. However, such operations, counterinsurgency operations, are the operations of the future. Insurgencies take place because some people want separation from the nation state. <coughs> Kashmir is an example. At one time, Punjab was an example. They want a separate nation. In the northeast of India, insurgencies were at time demanding separation. Now they are demanding more power for their community. The Naga wants more power, the Manipuri wants more rights, the Arunachali wants